Thank you, Dan, for the mood lighting. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds uh, today. Today we have the Williams Brothers presenting. Um, first will be Lloyd Williams. Uh, he has a patient presentation, 78-year-old uh, male with an intraocular mass. Uh, our second presenter uh, is Bryce Williams. Uh, he is presenting, is it a third and early worsening of diabetic retinopathy? Alrighty. Uh, good morning, everybody. Dr. Bernstein asked me to present this guy uh, yesterday, so sorry about the short notice. Um, hopefully, everybody had a chance to see him. He's a 78-year-old man presented to the VA with a uh, complaint of floaters beginning three weeks ago. And a uh, new brownish discoloration in his superior temporal visual field. Uh, he also, of note, has a history of having a skin melanoma on his right cheek, a uh, family history of with melanoma uh, and one with macular degeneration and a past ocular history that includes uh, IOLs in both eyes and an inferior temporal nevus in his right eye which was followed by optometry at the VA and he was last seen by them in 2006 and at that time the nevus was noted to be two disc diopters by two disc diopters and flat. Uh, so, when he presented to us on Friday, the, uh, <coughs> sorry, this is not working. All right, and <clears throat> this is the lesion we saw. It was a uh, relatively large, uh, darkly pigmented lesion with uh, surrounding uh <coughs> retinal detachment that appeared serous. There were no regmatogenous um, aspects to it. There uh, were no breaks seen in the retina either, and uh, this is infero. And it is uh, located infranasally in the right eye. Um, I also wanted to comment that the, the patient requested to be able to hear this talk, so he's in the room uh, right here. So these are just some more pictures of the same lesion. Um, as you can see, it's outside of the arcade and the macula is on. His uh, vision was 2060 in that eye. A uh, fluorescein angiogram was done yesterday in the retina clinic as well. Um, and they had some difficulty focusing on both uh, the, the retina and the lesion. So you're getting an out, out of focus view of the lesion here. Uh, but you can see quite a few vessels coursing over the, the top of the lesion. And that's an earlier view. So, um, you know, it's not really a diagnostic dilemma like a lot of the things that we present, but it was something that Dr. Bernstein felt was an opportunity to uh, discuss a very important uh, ocular disease, which also has some important systemic ramifications. So, in terms of how do choroidal melanomas present, 41% uh, have no signs and they're found incidentally on a uh, on an exam either for a lesion in the same or other eye or or just uh, as part of a routine exam uh, the most common presenting symptom would be uh, visual field defects or visual disturbances which is uh, what this patient was experiencing as well as flashes and floaters is about 15 percent so he had flashes and a visual field defect. 3% can have pain, which occurs if the uh, tumor invades into the, the nerves, and about, uh, or a, a small percentage. In, in this particular study uh, by Abramson in 1992, 
one of the 193 patients presented with metastatic disease. Um, from our standpoint, the signs of ocular melanoma, things we see when we look in, include uh, often a darkly pigmented mass, but not always uh, darkly pigmented. In fact, they can have uh, almost no pigment at all. Um, <coughs> there are sometimes overlying drusen, uh, orange pigments, or RPE changes. Um, however, even the orange pigmentation can be associated with some benign tumors as well. So, you know, a darkly pigmented mass with orange pigment over the top is very suggestive of melanoma, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, anterior tumors can also have sentinel vessels um, that are seen on the, the sclera um, going into the tumor. Uh, an advanced tumor may present as a blind, painful eye uh, with proptosis. Uh, s secondary to transscleral extension of the tumor into the orbit. And uh, rarely it's possible to also have a melanoma that spreads diffusely in the choroid. Uh, these can be relatively difficult to diagnose because they don't have the characteristics that we're usually looking for. And these often result in a serous retinal detachment. Uh, so when a patient presents with something that you think is a likely to be a choroidal melanoma, it's important to do uh, several tests. Uh, one is ultrasound, um, although imaging modes such as CT and, and uh, MRI exist, the ultrasound is still the best way to characterize the, the, uh, the tumor in this case. A scan ultrasound, uh, not a, a great photo, but it shows uh, initial high spike and then low to medium uh, reflectivity in the tumor, and then the second spike, of course, is the, uh, the sclera. Um, you can also sometimes see uh, vascular pulsations as fine oscillations in the low to medium reflectivity spikes here. Um, in addition, B-scan ultrasound is used to characterize the uh, size, thickness, diameter of the uh, tumor and help you uh, with prognosis and with uh, choosing appropriate modes of treatment. Uh, UBM can also be used to look to see if there is anterior extension of the tumor or some tumors can actually occur at or in the ciliary body um, and so UBM is a good modality for looking at tumors that are much more anterior than this particular patient's. Um, in addition to those uh, FA is commonly done, and it will show uh, vascularity in the, in the lesion, uh, usually. Um, it also tends to show late diffuse staining. A CT and MRI uh, could be used. You, you can see these lesions on those two modalities, but um, due to cost and lack of sensitivity, they would be impractical compared to ultrasound but it would be potentially possible to pick up one of these lesions um, in the process of doing a, a CT scan for some other reason. Um, so that might be one uh, way that a patient could potentially present. Um, in addition, I if there were a, a non-pigmented lesion that, uh, were that you were very concerned about, you could potentially do a biopsy, um, unlike retinoblastoma, this is a tumor which is much less likely to uh, have a transscleral escape secondary to a biopsy, although the papers that I read recommended um, beginning treatment essentially immediately after the biopsy to prevent that. Um, another important factor is that uh, the patient needs to be screened for metastasis, which is um, if present, uh, in an important factor in, in determining treatment. Uh, most patients do not present with uh, metastasis that can be detected at the uh, time of their initial diagnosis. Um, in the collaborative ocular melanoma uh, study, publication number 23, only 1% had uh, metastasis at presentation. The five-year cumulative rate, however, is 24 percent, 
and metastasis is, of course, the most feared complication of uh, choroidal melanoma. <coughs> most metastases, uh, depending on the site uh, studied in, in this particular publication, uh, ranging from 56 to 100 percent of metastases occurred in the liver. Uh, other sites can include skin, subcutaneous tissue, and lung. Uh, they recommended screening with liver function tests and in patients who had at least one abnormal liver function test, the sensitivity was 14% um, and the specificity was 92.3%. So that's a pretty excellent specificity, but the sensitivity is, is, uh, is poor. And there aren't really uh, other practical good ways of, of screening. So it's, it's still advocated that patients have liver function tests um, every six months. Uh, to a year uh, in order to, to screen for um, metastasis. The uh, prognosis, a 10-year survival, depending on the study, ranges from roughly 50% to 70%. Uh, concerning factors include large size, anterior location, uh, if it has escaped the eye through transscleral extension, uh, growth through Brooks membrane, which appears as a uh, as a mushroom-shaped tumor, um, optic nerve extension, lack of pigmentation, increased vascularization, and, and histo histologic uh, features such as mitotic activity and cell type. And for the sake of time, uh, sorry, Dr. Mamos, I'm not going to go through the histology. Um, potential treatments for choroidal melanoma. Uh, depend in part on the size of the melanoma. Uh, most sources recommended enucleation for large tumors, although um, I have seen uh, examples of proton beam or gamma knife being used on tumors greater than 10 millimeters in thickness and greater than 15 millimeters in diameter. Um, <coughs> in general, however, radiation is used in medium-sized tumors and in some cases can be vision sparing depending on the location of the tumor. So, for example, a, a tumor in the macula or at and around the optic nerve is not likely to be, you're not likely to have a vision sparing outcome. But a peripheral tumor, you, you may actually get a, a good vision outcome um, through one of the radiation uh, treatments. <laughs> uh, the most common would be uh, sewing a plaque uh, designed for the patient's particular tumor onto the outside of the eye and uh, using that to deliver radiation. Um, proton beam is probably the second most um, uh, published method. Uh, that's limited by the need for a particle accelerator, which are, are rare in the United States. Uh, when I last looked it up, there were seven. There may be more now. Um, some other less commonly used techniques would be used for for small tumors, uh, such as laser photocoagulation and transpupillary thermotherapy. Um, in the literature, there was no difference between uh, using a radiation plaque or a nucleation in terms of survival or uh, metastasis. Um, choroidal melanoma is the most common primary ocular tumor, about uh, six to eight in a million. Um, it's slow growing. The prognosis in terms of um, survival is, is probably better than for, say, an advanced skin melanoma. Um, but still, in, in terms of ocular diseases, is, is a very serious one. Um, and the, the modality of treatment has not been shown to affect metastasis or survival, but the tumor volume and location um, and some of the other things I showed on the previous slide have been. And uh, it's, it's thought that perhaps the most important thing with regard to survival is whether or not it has metastasized. And, and so even though less than 1% um, presented with already known metastasis, um, it's thought that the patients who go on to have metastasis even after treatment likely had them prior to treatment and and so essentially the cat was already out of the bag. Um, and these pictures just show a melanoma
pr before and after treatment with a uh, radiation clot. Mm -hmm. And these are uh, B-scan ultrasounds of a tumor before and after treatment. Um, and these, these two come from a study I did with Jay Duker <laughs> on this subject. Any questions? Yes. That's correct. Absolutely. But the choroidal nevus was noted to be in the infranasal quadrant. Um, so this patient actually has, as I noted, an interesting family history of five family members, including one who died of uh, skin melanoma. And it's thought, um, and he also had some genetic testing done at the Huntsman, which indicated that his family was and himself were at increased risk for um, melanoma. It's thought that the genetics of skin melanomas and choroidal melanomas are different. And so an increased risk of one is not necessarily an increased risk of the other. Just point out that uh, a lot of those analyses that are done, however, are based upon relatively limited numbers in terms of fat that you have. Tumor right. <coughs> so uh, it, it, I think it speaks in its favor that they were, they were sort of separated. But, but understanding why some people are ill and understanding that, that there is a, an unusual situation that's widely spread in medical and in normal and all of a sudden the immune system is shut down and, and the genes take and it's a radical loss of all people and systems that maybe they should have been sick and all of a sudden it's, it's all completely normal and caused the immune system to shut down critically and, and somehow figuring out what can trigger that kind of a long response to one of those things that's going on is critical and what would be something to be afraid of. I know so far Attempt at enhancing uh, in, uh, the immune system through immune therapy has, has so far not been successful, but I, I can't rule out all these uh, with normal immune systems. I think that you know, it's, it's the holy grail of trying to get out. What, what causes this uh, uh, set out now by Oakland? Is Dr. Yu going to be there soon? Uh, Dr. Harry is going to see him at 9.15. So I, I don't know the size. Um, I would suspect it, it's medium and large. And interestingly, too, from the genetic standpoint, um, some studies have shown that, that tumors that exhibit monosomy of chromosome 3 are more, much more likely to metastasize. And it's not, known whether, it's not known whether that information can yet be used in, in a meaningful way um, that would affect patient survival or treatment. Yeah, 
and the COMS trial now actually has quite impressive numbers. Uh, you know, over 7,000 patients have, have been entered into the trial. So for something which is pretty rare, that's, that's a good number. Dr. Patel. Yeah, thanks for that input. Dr. Hare? And it can sometimes go from the eye to the skin, too. And that's, in the, my reading, that would be <coughs> probably more common. That's more common than the other way that it works. So we get right back all the tests that we would get if it was just a little CT. Yeah, so he'll be referred on to Dr. Winwood, and uh, we'll see. And we'd like to thank Dr. Yes. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you.